Okay, thank you. All right, when to take your Bibles uh, to First Peter chapter one, First Peter chapter one. All right, uh, today I want to speak to you about uh, something that I believe is common to all of us, breaking the cycle of repetitive sin. Sins that you don't want to do, and you try in many ways, and it catches you out all the time, and then you do the same sin again and again and again. And uh, it begins to look much uh, like this. <coughs> You try and pluck out that sin, pull it out, and what happens? <laughs> but it goes. And you do it again and again, and you can watch that a hundred times, and you think, yeah. Uh, isn't that true of us? And uh, we see the same sins happening again and again. I just need to... I'll get this onto one slide there so I can see what's going on. How do we break that pattern of sin? How do we break that cycle? And uh, a message I heard some time ago uh, by Dr. Stanley uh, really cemented this as I was doing, uh, listening to his messages on First Peter. And uh, this passage caught me. And I said, yes, there's the answer. There's the solution. That's, uh, that, that's the answer. You see, if you think about the sin and you're just worried about that sin and that's all you're thinking about, you will do it again and again and again. So how do we break the pattern? How do we break the cycle of this repetitive sin? And uh, if you take your Bibles um, to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 to 16, we're going to read a recipe that will enable you, I believe, to have victory over this repetitive sin in your life. And we're going to show you why and uh, explain it to you why this is so. Let's read together verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance. But, like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And as you'll notice this morning, the hymns that we have sung so far were really all designed to highlight the grandeur of God, but the holiness of God, the greatness of God, and uh, this God that we serve is a holy, holy, holy God. Isaiah saw the vision of God, and as he saw the vision of Christ in the temple, seated upon the throne, the seraphim above the throne were crying out, and they ceased not to cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. We then saw in Revelation chapter 4, in the very throne room of God, those living creatures that are there, and uh, I always uh, am amazed that as you go into chapter 4 in Revelation, uh, when Jesus invites you to come before the throne of grace, picture that throne in your mind. Think how big this universe is, the, the gazillions of stars, galaxies, and all that are out there. And yet God is in his uh, heaven and on a throne, seated on a throne. How big is this throne? How big is the crystal sea before the throne? How big are these living creatures that are covered with eyes back and front? 
full faces on them. And yet they cry out, holy, holy, holy is God. And he is worthy of our worship. And what a great reminder uh, that God is this holy. And uh, uh, in Matthew chapter 6, uh, 26, sorry, Matthew chapter 26, uh, Jesus was speaking to his disciples. So Peter is in authority on this subject. And uh, we know that uh, Jesus, just before he went to the, uh, the cross, the night before he was betrayed, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he was speaking to his disciples. He came to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little bit beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come and enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. They, they, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ gave Peter and the other disciples the recipe. He said they keep watching. What are we watching for? We're watching for the enemies of God. We're watching for those things that want to tempt us to sin. He said, keep watching, keep praying that you do not enter into temptation. Yes, the spirit is willing, but that's not enough. Just having a willing spirit is not enough. <coughs> you are not going to overcome sin that way. Can someone give me some water, please? <coughs> Thanks, Lord. Not yet. <coughs> So, <clears throat> we know Peter didn't watch. He didn't pray. Give me all sorts of things here, thank you. <clears throat> you don't want to listen to a frog for the rest of the message, I'm sure. Um, Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, um, so Peter didn't keep watch. He didn't keep praying. What happened? He denied the Lord three times. He didn't see that coming. He said to Jesus, I will never. <laughs> I'm going to follow you. I'm going to die. Thank you. I will never sin against you. Haven't you said that? I'm not going to do this again, Lord. I won't do it. And the next thing he found himself sinning without even thinking, denying Jesus three times. And it took one look from the Lord to break him. And he went out and he wept bitterly. How many times have you done that? You sin, you think of the Lord, <clears throat> and we have to go out weeping over our sin. Bitterly. The recipe, which I believe that Peter writes here for us, not only for us, but out of tried and proven practice in his own life, is right here to be found in these verses. And the first thing he says here, we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared for action. If you're not prepared for action, you are going to fall. You will sin. And the thing is to wake up in the morning and to realize that the Christian life is a battle. We're in a war. We're in a fight. And we're in a fight to the end. Pastor Philip, your thing's doing some weird things here. Uh, your iPad's possessed. Uh, something. Uh, uh, just went black. Um, and yeah. So, 
We're in a war. And if we forget that we're in a war, guess what? You are going to fall. I once read that it's like waking up in the morning and you're not thinking about life and you in your, put your house gown on, your pajamas and everything, and you go into the kitchen and you're still busy wiping out the, the sleep out of your eyes and you, you sort of reach to switch to the kettle on so you can get that, uh, you know, that black liquid in the coffee to wake you up and you turn around and there's a samurai warrior in your kitchen with his sword drawn and he's coming towards you. What were you doing? Fuss on the slab. You didn't see that coming. It's like a soldier going out to battle. And Paul has given us uh, uh, weapons and told us about the weapons of warfare that we are to put on because we are engaged in a battle. God has enemies, three enemies of God, the world, the flesh, the devil, the world, the philosophies of this world that are anti-God, the flesh, your old man that lives in you, possibly your biggest enemy right now, your biggest, uh, the one that will take you out quicker than anything else. And then the devil, listen to what Paul said. He said, finally, the, the final thing I want to write to you after writing in that amazing book of Ephesians, uh, all the things that God has done for us and how we to love. And he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything, to stand firm in the battle. What are we to do? We're to clothe ourselves with the armor of God. And as he was sitting in the prison there, he looked at these guards and he said, let me give you an illustration of what this is. Take the belt of truth, which is the word of God, truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. Let's take the truth that Jesus spoke, taught us through the word of God. Is the final revelation of God to mankind, and we need to know this truth. Let's buckle that on ourselves. Then put on the breastplate of righteousness. What's that there for? So that you do not live according to your emotions, your feelings. They will take you out quicker than anything, and your emotions and your feelings change a thousand times during the day. They are not to be trusted. The word of God is to be trusted. Put on the breastplate of righteousness so that you don't act emotionally. We act according to truth. The word of God is true. We have the breastplate of righteousness. Next, take the helmet of salvation. The helmet is going to guard your mind, your thinking, your thoughts. It's going to guard, and that helmet was a full helmet that came right over the face. It's going to guard your ears, what you're listening to, what you're looking at, and it focuses your eyes, that helmet, and we are to keep our eyes focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. What is going on in your mind? Do you have the helmet of salvation on? And then he says, put on the boots of peace. What is life really all about? It is about Jesus Christ using you to walk out there and share him with other people. With a lost and with a dying world. And then he says, take up the shield of faith, which is able to extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. I say it again. The shield of faith in Jesus Christ and his word is able to extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. And you have to have in mind that you're coming out towards a, a castle and all these spiritual forces of wickedness. What are they doing? They are firing fiery darts at you. They come in by the thousands. They come all day. They come every day. They come at night. They come at any time. One of those land in your head and you start thinking and it starts burning in you. What are they doing? They're trying to cause you to act independent of God and live according to your flesh and sin against God. But we don't, sometimes we're so asleep, we don't even hear the hiss of the serpent. As he speaks to you, as he gossips into your ear and he speaks to you, you don't have to obey God. You don't have to deny God. It's all right if you do that. God will be okay with that. 
In Psalm 51, God says, I'm not okay with that. You think I'm okay with you because I'm not answering you right now. I don't judge you. The lightning doesn't come down. It doesn't strike us. And you think you're okay. You think I am like you. Be careful because that's what the serpent will tell you. God is okay with you if you do this. It's only a small sin. He won't buy. He didn't judge you last time, did he? He's not going to do anything, and then we sin and we fall. We need the shield of faith up. Our faith, uh, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It goes back to the belt of truth. Everything has to be filtered through the word of God, through this book, and you need to know it from Genesis to Revelation. Otherwise, Satan will take you out. The shield of faith must be up to extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. And then you pull out the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which are the verses that you have meditated on, memorized, made part of your life, and you live by them, you're convicted by them, you pull out that sword, and you're able to slay the devil and say, no, God says this. The word of God says this. That is wrong. This is right. The problem, too many of us pull out, and what have we got? Two picks. And you want to poke the devil with a toothpick? Come on. Take you out. He's laughing at you. And so we'll sin. Paul said, armor. Put on the full gospel armor. And uh, in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul would have been one to say, well, God's not doing anything for me. What is God doing for me? <laughs> Look at Paul's life. It doesn't mean that everything's going to go hunky dory in your life, but if you're not armed with the armor of God, you'll be taken out of the fight and you will be found to be useless and worthless as a Christian. Not an accolade anybody would want to hear from the Lord at the, when we see him face to face. Look at Paul there in verse 25. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, in dangers from robbers, dangers from countrymen, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among the false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food in cold and exposure. Apart from all these things, he said, I have the daily pressure of caring for the churches that I've been planting about praying for the souls of those. And uh, did he give up? No. He says, uh, I've, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And in the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. If Paul had not put the armor of God on, he would have been taken out. He was beaten by the Jews. He was stoned, left for dead. It was, all these things happened to him. And, and we, it's just something... Minor happens to us, and well, now we're fainting and uh, we're giving up on God. And wow, why is God doing this to me? And all this, and God said, I'm fair, doesn't he love me? Doesn't he hear my prayers? No, God's not with me. I, 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 and we want to give up so quickly. None of us have been through that, something like that that Paul has been through. And yes, there are martyrs right down, and you can read Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, Extreme Devotions, and things like that. And then you see the real sense when they suffer. They stand firm. Why are they standing firm? Because when they opened their eyes in the morning, they were ready for action. Are you ready that anything could happen today? That the devil may attack today? <clears throat> that the world, something may go on in the world? Russia drops a nuke on Iran. Or uh, not Iran because they're friends. And it won't happen here because we're also friends with them. Uh, on, on Ukraine. What would happen? I remember when 9 11 happened. Uh, I was in Monando's and uh, I was watching the TV there. And uh, I was thinking, what? Why are they playing movies now on the, 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 the TV? And I saw the first building go down. I think, what, what movie is this? And then I. 
suddenly realized, no, this is real. This is news broadcast. The next thing, a lady from the, the store next door, um, Subway, she had obviously watched it there on her TV and that, and uh, came running into my shop, screaming hysterically, it's the end of the world. Don't see how to tell her, get a grip. It's not the end of the world. Uh, that's happening there, not here. Let's just watch and see what's going to happen. But if something's happening out there, how often does that affect you? When things happen on the global stage, how often do those things affect you and impact our lives? Yes, they do. Paul woke up each day ready, armed for battle, ready for the fight. No matter what came his way, he trusted God. He said, I've, I've fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. So the first thing is you need to be ready. You need to be prepared for action. You're in a war. Stop sleeping. Get out of the pajamas. Put on the armor of God. You can't go to war in pajamas. Get out and put every piece of the armor of God on. The belt, the breastplate, the helmet, the boots, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, and a prayer life. Stay in communication with the commander. Stay in communication with your Lord and be ready for action and say, Lord, how do you want to use me today? And what's going to happen today? I don't know, but Lord, you know. And uh, I'm ready now to face the battle with you, Lord, with this armor on. The problem is when you don't and you are just coasting along in your faith and things seem to knock you from one side to the other, you know what the Lord said? This is the most detestable position you can be in. Look what he said to the church in Revelation chapter 3. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, right, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. I wish that you were dead, that you weren't a Christian. Oh, I wish that you were absolutely fervent on fire for me. Look what he says. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. The Greek is a bit more graphic. I will vomit you out of my mouth. You're detestable to me. Lukewarm Christianity to the Lord is the most detestable thing. And I'm telling you now, we're living in the West, and Western Christianity is exactly this. It's lukewarm. Nobody wants to step out by faith. Nobody wants to be too zealous because then you'd be considered nuts or crazy or something. You would go and do that for the Lord. Ah. Lukewarm. Lukewarm. You go out there in your pajamas. You are lukewarm. You don't get ready for battle. You are lukewarm. You don't go share your faith. You are lukewarm. Be prepared for action. Stand up. We're in a fight. Get ready. The next thing he says there, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Okay? Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Are you sober in spirit? Listen to a couple of verses out of the word. But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus but I utter words of sober truth. Being sober in spirit means I've got to make a balanced response. So I go out, I'm armed up, I'm ready for the battle, and I get out there and something happens. Now's the time to be sober spirited, to make a balanced response. Not on my emotions, not on what the serpent is saying to me, but on truth. On truth, sober truth. First Corinthians 15, verse 34. Become sober minded as you ought and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. He says to the Corinthian church, ah, You're Christians. He's talking to believers. He's talking to saints. And he says, I, I'm, I'm ashamed of you. You don't even know God. Because you're not sober minded. 
You're giving yourself over to the world, the flesh, the devil, your friends, and everybody. You're not walking as God wants you to walk. You don't even know the Bible. You don't know God. You don't know the truth that is in the Bible that teaches you about this God that you claim to serve. Someone says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Meditates, fills his mind with, ponders on, questions, thinks about uh, God all day, all night. Becomes sober-minded. Then you'll be able to do verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Be steadfast on the truth. Be sober-minded. Think right. Think godly. Think what Jesus would do. First Thessalonians 5, 6. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep, do they sleep in at night? And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. 2 Timothy 4, 5. But you be sober in all things, not just in some things, all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul telling this to Timothy? Yes, come on. Uh, This is what you've got to be doing. Be sober, Timothy, in all things. Endure this hardship. It's worth it. First Peter 4, verse 7, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be a sound judgment and be sober sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Praying to God. You see, the problem comes... We wake up and get out of life and something happens and it shakes our whole world. And then we forget there's a God and then we're running here and everywhere and then we run into this one and doctor and this one and this guru and that one and our friends and what must I do? How would you do it? And we look for the pragmatic solution of the problems and then we're trying to fix our own problems and everything. Where's God in the picture? Where's the Lord in the picture? Out the window. Where is he in your life when something happens? Where do you go first? Do you realize that God causes all things to work together for good? Qualifying phrase, for those who love him. God is busy at work. No matter what's happening in your life, even if it's something that's terrible that's just happened, God causes all things to work together for good. For those who love him, as he's doing a work in you, conforming you to the image of Jesus Christ. Peter says, be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking somebody to devour. Who do you think that someone is? It's you. (laughs) It's me. He's coming. He's prowling like a roaring lion. He's coming out to get you. Be sober. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 says, The steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. In God the Lord, we have an everlasting rock. What are you standing on? What's your foundation? Sand or rock? Jesus is the rock and we stand on him. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near, Isaiah 55. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his his thoughts. There's a sober thinking again. And let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Tyron was just saying to me, I read a commentary, somebody that was saying, in the Bible, anybody who had reasoned with themselves, nothing good came out of that. No good 
comes out of our own thinking. What does it say in Proverbs? Get wisdom. Acquire wisdom. Get the wisdom. Get it. And then with wisdom, get understanding. Don't reason with yourself. The minute you start reasoning with yourself, we learned about that in Bible study on Thursday night. First mistake the rich man made was he reasoned with himself. And he said, wow, I've got all these crops. I don't know where to put them. I'll tear down my barns, build bigger ones, and then I, me, and myself will be happy. And then I can uh, put my feet up. I can relax and everything. And God thunders out of heaven and says, you fool. Don't you know how I require your soul today? You are dead today. Then what? Who's going to spend your money? Family are just waiting to have a party. Okay. Are you living for God? Are we thinking soberly? Are we acting soberly? Paul said, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Do you know that God is at work in you? He's never stopped working in you. He's promised never to leave you nor forsake you. So he's at work on the day of salvation. You got saved. He's busy sanctifying you. He's using everything in your life to try and sanctify you, to conform you to the image of Christ. And then verse 12 in chapter 2, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out, live it out, your Christianity, your salvation, with fear and trembling. I work it out before me, your God. Live it out. Not work out uh, to get saved, but work out the fact that you are saved. Work it out. It's the same as being steadfast, immovable, always abounding with the work of the Lord. Why? Verse 13, listen to this. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work. For what? His good pleasure. Let me bounce this back on you. Is God pleased with you? Are you a pleasure to God? Does he find delight in you? Today, in your life, is it, are you a delight to him? If you're not sober, you're not a delight to him. If you're not prepared for action, you are not a delight to him. When Bishop John Chrysostom, we use this in a Bible study, was brought before the Empress Eudoxia, he threatened him with banishment if he insisted on his Christian independence. As a preacher, he said to her, you cannot banish me, for this world is my father's house. But I will kill you, said the empress. No, you cannot, for my life is hid with Christ in God, said John. I will take away your treasures. No, you cannot, for my treasure is in heaven and my heart is there. But I will drive you away from your friends and you will have no one left. No, you cannot. For I have a friend in heaven from whom you cannot separate me. And then he said, I defy you, for there is nothing you can do to harm me. How would you have responded <laughs> to something like that? <clears throat> please don't, please, my money, uh, my wealth, my life, oh, please. Well, you will if you don't put the Lord first in your life. So be prepared, be sober, be hopeful, okay? Be hoping. Let's look what he says here. Ah, let's go there. For fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Right, I prepare my mind for action. I get sober in my thinking. I'm thinking Christ-like. I'm thinking word-based. And now he says, Live in light of eternity, that day that you will see Jesus Christ, and then maybe he will come back today. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. If he came today, what would happen? <coughs> Do you know? The rapture would take place. We'd be out of here. We don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, First Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as to the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, 
and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, then I, then me, us, believers in Christ, <coughs> will be caught up, raptured with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 51, we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye into glorified bodies and we'll be looking at our Savior, Jesus Christ, face to face. And we'll see in heaven. We'll see him in heaven, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Our Lord, our God, who is worthy of all worship right here, right now, and then for eternity. We sang about that this morning. And uh, Revelation chapter 19, we are looking for the soon appearing of our great God and Savior. First in the rapture, and then to know that he's coming back to sort out this earth. And you read Revelation chapter 19, he's coming back as the king of kings. He's coming with the army, he'll seize the beast, the false prophet, the devil. The devil will be thrown into the bottomless pit. Uh, the beast and the false prophet and Babylon will fall and then Jesus will come and set up his reign for a thousand years. He'll rule with a rod of iron. We will rule and reign with him. And there'll be peace on this earth, a forced peace, at the end of which he will let out Satan. Satan will round up all those who still have refused Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then God will destroy them from heaven with fire. Then a new heaven and a new earth, and we'll dwell with God. No more sin, no power of sin, no effect of sin for all eternity. Are you hoping in that? Do you wake up in the morning expecting the Lord may come today? What will he find you doing? Sleeping? Pajamas? Hmm? Sinning? So it's a rapture, and that rapture takes place in the twinkling of an eye, because if the Lord said, I'm coming in 10 minutes, what would you do? Be running for the gold, the most precious thing that you have, running around, grabbing stuff, and you can't take anything with you. It's a rapture. God, too late. Too late to serve him. Too late to do anything for him. And then we stand before him, our great God and Savior. Next thing he says, be faithful. Now, if you don't get this first part right, you're not going to be faithful. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance. You see, the problem, if you're not prepared for battle, if you're not sober, if you're not living in light of eternity in the day that you're going to stand before Jesus Christ, you are going to sin. Why? Because it's a default thing in our lives. I, when something terrible happens to me, I want to comfort myself with my sin. And this is where you go wrong. We comfort ourselves. And Peter says, as obedient children to Jesus Christ, to the word of God, to the truth of God, to our Lord and Savior, who may come imminently, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance. Don't go and comfort yourself. Don't run to, to do something that's going to comfort you. What do we do? We pick up the bottle again. We pick up the pills again. We run to the doctor for more pills. We run here for this. We run there for that. And as I've told you before, somebody once said to me, Makassar, you only need one pill. What's it? The gospel. Yeah. And that's Christ. You need him. Don't sin. Don't sin. Don't go back. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful to not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with a temptation, well, Provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. 
Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope in the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to what? Redeem us from what? Every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. You don't have to sin. But if you don't think right, you will sin. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 34, become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning. Stop it. Stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. Peter wrote in 2 Peter, just before he died, he says, um, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence, for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by us. Then he says, keep adding to your faith. What do you want to add to your faith? Moral excellence. The standard is, I want to be Christ-like. Moral excellence. Add to that knowledge. My intimate, personal knowledge of God, who loved me and gave his life for me and saved me. Add to knowledge. Perseverance. So I get the self-control. I learn about him. I study him, I study how he wants me to learn self-control, I take responsibility for my actions. Then he says, add to that perseverance. Don't just do that once. Continue doing that. Continue growing, continue learning, continue to be self-control under the fruit of the, uh, uh, under the power of the Holy Spirit. Self-control. Be controlled, take responsibility, and then persevere at it. And what are you becoming? Godly. Add godliness to your life. Can somebody, would other people say, you're a godly person? Is that the testimony you have? That you are godly? And to godliness, add brotherly love for one another. That's why we cannot be individual Lone Ranger Christians out there all by yourself. Loving who? Loving yourself. No. He brought us together into the church to love one another fervently. And by this you shall know that all men will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. No self-love here. Love one another. Die to self. Love others. And then to your brotherly love, add love. Love for the lost out there. Love enough to go and tell them about Jesus Christ. Are you faithful? Are you sinning? So the next time that sin comes up, you've got to think, am I prepared for this? What's, what's happening here? Be sober and everything. No, I've got to be faithful. I've got to stop sinning. What must I do? Get into the word of God and God will tell you what to do, what to replace that sin off. It's a principle in scripture. Put off, put on. Put off, put on. What are we putting off? Put off the sin. Put on Christ's likeness. Think like Christ. Act like Christ. Do what Christ did. Speak like him. Look like he did. And, and listen to him and listen to others and don't do what Christ would do in this situation. Final step in the recipe, be holy. Look what he says there, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which are yours in ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. God will not change for you. He cannot change. He's immutable. He's holy, holy, holy. And when you see something in Hebrew that is mentioned three times, that's the way that they make exclamation upon something. You cannot say it even, you cannot say it more than that. Holy, holy, holy. What don't you understand about that? Holy, holy, holy. It, it's absolute that they say. That is God. He can't change. 
So you must turn it to be like him. And by the way, you are holy already. The minute you got saved, you're positionally holy. You're a saint. Positionally, you are separated from the world to God. 1 Corinthians 1, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. That church said, you'd look at those people and you'd look down there and uh, down through Corinthians and say, are these people saved? Yes, they are. Look here. To those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, holios, hagios, the word, holy by calling with all who in every place, call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul begins to admonish them, get them right. Romans chapter 8, we are being conformed to the image of Christ, who is absolutely holy. Romans chapter 12, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, what? Holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect to you. The problem is, if you're not going to be holy, if you don't get up in the morning and realize you don't belong to yourself, you belong to Christ, you're not going to be holy. And he's not going to reveal his will to you if you are not holy. Because that's where you have to start. You have to be holy. Oh, well, I don't know what God's will for me is. He doesn't answer my prayers. He's not doing this. Well, let me ask you, are you holy? Are you holy? Are you conforming your life to the world? Or are you transforming your mind? What, what, tell me about your scripture reading, study, meditation, memorizing. What, what do you, how do you handle the scriptures? When do you read the scriptures? Uh, how much of the scriptures do you read? How much of the word of God do you know? How much is it in your life? How much is it coming out of you? How much are you sharing the word of God? How much are you being faithful? How, how are you walking with Christ? How's your prayer life? Peter said, don't forget, we have been transformed. We have been built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. We, Christ is our great mediator. He's our great high priest. Down here, we have been built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. A holy priesthood. I remind you once again that our God is holy, holy, holy. He's the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies of heaven. The whole earth is full of his glory. Those creatures cry not in heaven, they're holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. He is coming. Be holy. Want to break the cycle of the sin in your life? Be prepared for action. Be sober in your response. Be hoping in the return of Christ, maybe today. Be faithful and don't sin. Don't sin. Choose Christ, rather. And be holy like God. I pray the Lord will bless this recipe to your life. And you can take it away and think about it and meditate on it and chew on it and go back over 1 Peter 1, verse 13 to 16. Look at that recipe and say, is this true in my life, Lord? Help me. You know, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So without Jesus Christ, firstly, in your life, none of this you can do. You'll just keep sinning. But because Jesus is in our lives, we have direct access to him. He said, come to my throne. You'll find mercy, forgiveness for your sins. You'll find grace to help in time of need. How are we going to get this right in our lives? By the grace of God. Go and ask him for that grace to make this 
true in your life. And if you don't know him as your personal Lord and Savior, he wants to, you to have victory over sin in your life. He wants to come into your life. He stands at the door of uh, the church in the Revelation, but he could be standing at the door of your heart today, knocking on that door and saying, I want to come into your life. I want to help you live this. First, I want to save your soul, and then I'm going to help you live a victorious life so that you don't have to come succumb to sin all the time. Why don't you open the door? I love you so much. I died for you on the cross at Calvary. I've paid the price for all your sin. Let me in. I'm knocking on the door of your heart. And if you have never opened the door of your heart and allowed Jesus Christ to come in, and maybe before you go to sleep tonight, when you're alone, on your bed, that you would just call out to him and say, Lord, thank you for dying for me on the cross. You're not part of my life. I don't have victory over all these things in my life. Maybe I'm fooling myself, but maybe you're not there. Thank you for dying for me. Please come into my life. I'm opening the door now. And ask him in. Invite him in. He's not going to force himself on you. He will just keep knocking. Open the door and let him in. And then live this victorious life. May the Lord bless you. Amen. Stand and sing this in great in holy, holy, holy.